The following program is in no way intended to replace your doctor's advice or treatment program, nor should it be used as a tool for the purpose of self-diagnosis. Well, welcome to Your Health, Your Choice. Um, we just want to say at the very start that uh, we are doing a pre-recorded program today, so you will not be able to uh, make any uh, call-ins. Um, soon we'll return to our live shows. Um, we're going to go straight into medicine today. You, as, as you know, Your Health, Your Choice is all about uh, empowering you to make uh, proper health decisions, um, empowering family members and communities to make decisions that will improve long-term health outcomes. So we're going to go to medicine today. Well, we're going to address three areas. Um, and uh, today, medicine today uh, will not be so much about um, new discoveries, but I'm going to, first of all, talk about a new product. Um, you know, a lot of patients come into us and uh, they're constantly complaining about having to prick their fingers to take uh, blood samples. And of course, you know, the cornerstone of diabetes care is uh, to empower you to know what your numbers are. So we say that you should know what your blood sugar readings or your HbA1c is. That's A. B is your blood pressure and C, your cholesterol levels. That's the ABCs of diabetes and knowing your numbers is uh, very important. But um, people absolutely hate, and I understand this, having to prick your fingers uh, every single day, uh, sometimes two or three times a day is extremely difficult. But there's a new uh, pro product on the market called the Freestyle Libri. Um, Freestyle Libri. Now, this is not an actual meter, but it's a device that can be used, it's a patch that can be inserted on the arm and the patch is left on for about 14 days and uh, there's a little sensor that goes right under the skin and that sensor is uh, actually measuring your blood sugars every 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, if, you, if you check that, after one day, you will have uh, probably about 100 readings and after 14 days, you'll have about 1,500 readings. It's called, it's called a Freestyle Libre. Now, we have one person in Trinidad who has um, brought the product in. Um, uh, she is uh, based at the Caribbean Lifestyle Center, Anaika Sanyo, and um, she's now in the process of putting the package together so patients can come in, have this patch inserted, and uh, it's left on for 14 days. And at the end of those 14 days, uh, there's a device that can actually download all the information. Uh, we uh, will give you, well, the telephone number, if you want to find out more about this product, is um, we'll give you our telephone number, 482-4269, 482-4269. But uh, if you uh, Google or go on Facebook, Caribbean Lifestyle Center, it's based in Chagonas. Anika is a Caribbean diabetes educator. She's very much at the forefront of diabetes education in this country. And uh, um, she's uh, really trying to bring us up to date with uh, new information and new ways of measuring the blood sugars. Now, of course, there's a, there will be a cost to this. And it doesn't completely replace the uh, meters. But what it will do, it will give us a lot of information in those 14 days and it will also give us information about extreme highs and when people are going very low. Now, one of the things about doing your HbA1c is that um, while the HbA1c will give you your average blood sugar for three months, it does not actually tell us when you're going extremely high or if you're having hypos. And especially hypos, is an area of great concern now in diabetes care. So that's called a Freestyle Libre product, and it's um, now available. Um, it's FDA approved, and uh, I'm sure more and more people are going to get into this um, program and uh, have a lot of more information available. 
The second thing I want to come to on medicine today is um, the good old area of herbal medicines. Uh, on this Sunday, actually, uh, Dr. Shireen Kalu, who is a gynecologist, um, I think she has um, uh, an article every Sunday, either the Express or Guardian, and she was uh, addressing the area of a patient who came to her and actually used an insecticide of some kind um, because the patient was having severe itching in the genital area, she was told by a herbalist to use an insecticide to spray that area. Now, yes, absolutely crazy. And uh, she, in that article, which I think is well worth reading, you can pull it back up on, on um, the web website. For uh, It's either the Sunday Express or Guardian. Um, Well-written article. I want to commend Dr. Kalu. Um, she's been doing an excellent job. Um, with these articles, but she once again highlighted the dangers of going to people who are not properly trained. Now, you know, I know that uh, we are sometimes hesitant and uh, people think that um, maybe we are too outspoken. But uh, of course, recently we uh, heard our, uh, I say good friend, I, I call him a crazy man, Trevor Sears, um, advising people to spray some sort of bug spray in their eyes for red eyes. Can you imagine that? Now, I'm pleased that I think the Minister of Health or the Ministry of, the Ministry of Health actually addressed that particular um, uh, situation. I think they came out and made a statement about that. So here we have someone who is very popular in Trinidad ad actually advising people to spray a bug spray of some kind in their eyes for red eyes. Now, now these are two extreme examples. Of course, the woman who used the insecticide to spray in the genital area ended up with severe blisters, infections. Um, fortunately, I think she was seen by the gynecologist and they were able to deal with the problem fairly quickly. Um, but the point we are making is that people are using all kinds of remedies. Um, and then they are running into problems. So, so we often hear about the side effects of prescription drugs, the side effects of aspirin, the side effects of statins, but very few people talk about the side effects of herbal supplements. And again, on Medicine Today, I think, you know, with World Diabetes Day coming up on November the 14th, once again, I, you know, every uh, day, even today, I was at my clinic in Point Fortin, and a patient came in and she was asking me about various herbal products. She actually had a book um, uh, that was written by someone advising on various products like aloes, et cetera, for cancer. Now, now I know that there are lots of people who believe that there are herbal products that can be used to treat cancers. I want to give you the other side of it. Unfortunately, I have seen quite a few patients who, having not opted for surgical intervention, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, have ended up dying prematurely, in my opinion, because they opted for herbal treatments for their cancers. I want to beg you again, as you, as you look on, that you look at what is being prescribed, look at the herbal products. And, and the, the problem is, patients often come in and say, Dr. Khan, what do you think about this? And I have to say to them very nicely, well, I don't think anything about it because, of course, I am not trained to make a statement on those products. What I can say is, it is not scientifically tested. Now, so, so I want you to understand this as I, we talk about medicine today. If you ask me about herbal products, I am not saying, well, of course, anybody who advises you to use an insect, insecticide spray in your eyes is a crazy person, or to spray insecticide on the genital area is absolutely crazy. So, and I use that term very accurately. It is, he is, he or she is crazy person to advise that and stay far away from them. But if you ask me about aloes and meringue, uh, what my response is, as a medical doctor, I'm trained in science. And science is based on double-blind placebo-controlled trials. Therefore, the medications I prescribe is based on a scientific approach. It is not based... Now, I am a pastor, of course, as you know. I believe in, 
and, and faith as well. But when you come to me for medical treatment, you don't come to me for prayer, although I do pray for a lot of my patients, but you're coming to me for my scientific knowledge. And, and therefore, um, I would not comment. I would say to my patients, if you choose to use those products, you take responsibility for using them. And if there are side effects, then don't blame the doctor for, for saying that, um, you know, he didn't know much about it. Because truly, we don't know a lot about some of these herbal products. And the last thing on medicine today is just an update, really, on, av on, on availability of drugs um, within the government service. We are still going through a tough time. We know that the budget was... Um, presented a, a few weeks ago, and there's been a lot of debate about taxation and uh, um, uh, previous regimes and this regime. I'm not getting into politics today. What my, my, my role is as an advocate for my patients, and what I would say is that we're still facing a severe shortage of basic drugs, a severe shortage of basic blood testing. Um, you know, we, we are still not getting uh, the HbA1c uh, measurement regularly. We're still not getting a full renal profile. And to do diabetic clinics properly, uh, it's very difficult to do those clinics without those proper basic, but those are basic blood testing. So I want to apologize to my patients. I have to ask you, these are my patients on the government service. Very often I have to ask you to do your blood test privately. It's not that I want to, it's because to do medicine properly, you have to have the proper blood testing. And, and, and on that note, as I end medicine today, uh, a patient brought in to me, there was the Diabetes Expo last week, and there was uh, an organization doing what is called a body scan. And they showed me these pages of information about the body scan. And again, they asked me, what do I think about it? And again, I had to say, well, I don't know how someone can put a little device on your finger and be able to tell you about your heart, your liver, your kidneys, uh, your colon, etc. Uh, you know, I call that abracadabra medicine. Yes, abracadabra medicine. You can quote me, abracadabra medicine. You cannot put a little device on the finger and tell someone that the liver is bad, they need detoxing. And the whole thing about this, after the patient had this, which was free, they were then given a list of medications over $2,500 costing that they should take for these illnesses. Of course, the patient could not afford it. So again, be wise. When you're going for treatments, know where you're going, who you're going to, and whether these methods have been scientifically tested. That's medicine today. Kiss the badge, kiss the badge. Oh, ho. Oh. What's that? Welcome to this edition of the interview. And as you can see, I'm not alone on the set. I have Marcus, a Liverpool fan, and I have Shakira. The 
Good evening, Trenda Bego. Welcome to another edition of Scoreboard here on ACT. And it's always a pleasure to be in your company every Tuesday evening between the hours of 8 and 9. Welcome back to Your Health, Your Choice. Uh, just a reminder, we are not live tonight. Uh, it's a pre-recorded program. We're going to restart our live programs in a few weeks' time. I know a lot of you um, like calling in, asking your questions, and we love um, receiving your calls, of course. So um, we're going to let you know soon enough when we restart our live programs. Um, one announcement before we go into our uh, main topic for today, which is actually on leg pains. So today it's not about diabetes per se, it's on leg pains, which is a very, very common symptom I see almost every day in my practice. Um, I want to tell you that we are hosting the Trinidad and Tobago Anaposa Center. We are hosting another seminar. It's our last seminar, I think, for the year. Um, we have hosted about two seminars. We had one on diabetes, I think, around August, and then we had one on mental health, um, both well attended and we had good feedback. Um, in celebration of World Diabetes Day, which is actually on November the 14th, um, we are having a seminar on Saturday, 11th of November. I want to repeat that day. Saturday, November the 11th, from 4 to 6 p.m. It's called a holistic approach to diabetes care. It's a free symposium. It's going to be held at the Anaposis Chapel, which is now located at number 12 Johnson Street in Cokie. The number for registration, and I'd advise you to ring in um, as soon as you can to start registering, it's 482-4269. So the name of the symposium is a holistic approach to diabetes care. We'll have a diabetes educator talking about nutrition, um, a podiatrist, Leanna Huntley. She'll be talking about foot care. And then we have an optometrist, Rishmi Mathur, who's an excellent optometrist talking about eye care. And I will also be giving a talk on, uh, on one or, um, of the several aspects of diabetes that we often talk about on these programs. So we'll have four speakers and we'll have uh, lots of time for questions. So we're going to go into leg pain. Now, you may ask, well, uh, Dr. Khan, why have you chosen leg pain? And uh, that, that's a kind of narrow subject. But actually, uh, the area of leg pain is a fascinating area. Um, and it's an area that um, it's, it's, it's a symptom that we see so often uh, in our day-to-day -day practice. And I'm going to actually present you with, uh, hopefully I'll have enough time, about uh, 10 causes of leg pain. Yes, 10 causes of leg pain. So, you know, if you go in to a doctor with leg pain and you don't give a proper history, it may be very, very difficult to come up with a proper diagnosis. So the first um, slide I want to bring up. Um, now, what I want to describe on this slide is you, it's on the left hand of the slide, you see that there are blood vessels. And you see at a certain point, the blood vessel is um, actually, the blood flow is not continuing down the leg. And on the right side, which is the calf area, you see that there's um, a not a proper circulation. Now, this is called peripheral vascular disease, peripheral vascular disease. So we can come off that slide and I'll um, talk a little bit about it. So uh, what is peripheral vascular disease? Um, it is where the there's a blockage to the blood flow, as commonly people would call circulation problems. Now, you know, the first, the, um, the first reason people often think about when we talk about um, leg pain is, uh, they often say, doc, is this a circulation problem? If there's darkening of the skin, again, very often, the first thing that patients are thinking about is circulation problems. Now, very often it's not um, the kind of circulation that we're talking about here, but PVD 
or peripheral vascular disease is due to a blockage of the arteries. So I, I want to repeat that. It's a blockage of the arteries. So you have two major blood vessel systems going to the leg. You have the arteries that deliver oxygenated blood to the muscles of the leg. And then you have the veins that drain blood from the legs. And you can have pain in the legs due to either one. So I'll come to varicose veins in, in, in a few minutes. But peripheral vascular disease is where there's a blockage, and very often in the thigh area, um, there's atheroma. Uh, now, very often when we talk about atheroma, we, we think about the heart, um, atherosclerotic disease. But of course, atherosclerotic disease, which is a buildup of plaque in the arteries, can affect um, the arteries to the heart, can affect the arteries to the brain, and can of course affect the arteries leading down to the legs. So very often you'll have a blockage in the thigh area and therefore the muscles in the calf and lower down the leg is not being supplied. So what are the typical symptoms a patient will have? So if a doctor takes a careful history, this is a fairly easy diagnosis to make. The patient will say, Doc, um, you know, when I'm walking, especially if I'm walking up a hill or steps, I get a cramping sensation in my calf. And when I stop or sit down for five minutes, the calf pain clears up and I'm able to walk again. That is textbook description of peripheral vascular disease. Textbook description. And um, I say it's a fairly easy diagnosis to make purely on history. And that's why taking a proper history is so important in doing medicine. And, uh, you know, when you go into a doctor, or when you go into your healthcare professional, it's not just saying, well, I have leg, leg pain, doc, um, give me some treatment for this. Giving the doctor, pro pro uh, giving the doctor a, proper, a proper history. So when you go into your physician, um, you give a proper history. And if that history is what we call intermittent claudication, I want to repeat that, intermittent claudication. That's where the blood supply is it's, it's able to keep up when you're walking normally, but when you start exercising, walking up a hill, putting the muscles under stress, the blood supply is cut off and it goes into a kind of cramping sensation. And then when you rest, you're able to uh, walk again. Now, the first thing we want to do about this is prevent the problem. Um, and preventing the problem means that if you're a smoker, you need to give up smoking. If you, are, if you have high cholesterol, your cholesterol needs to be treated. Diabetics get increased aggressive uh, uh, sort of atheroma buildup in the arteries right throughout the body. That's why diabetics are more prone to getting heart attacks and strokes and peripheral vascular disease. Uh, the treatment, um, we start with simple things like putting you on a statin, aspirin, uh, there are some other drugs, but ultimately you may need to see a vascular surgeon who may do an arteriogram um, of the legs. This is not, not the normal angiograms of the heart. It's an arteriogram or a CT scan with uh, a dye um, of the legs and you can identify where the blockage is. And it sometimes can be treated with a stent um, and, uh, but, but sometimes you need a bypass surgery of the legs. So they use a, a, a graft where they can bypass the blockage and the blood can be restored to the lower limbs. Now, so th the big problem with this is not just the pain, but if you get a, a cut on ulcer on the feet and the blood supply is not optimal, of course, the healing process is very difficult. And, and unfortunately, this is the problem often with diabetics who are smokers. Diabetics who are smokers, they end up getting um, an ulcer on the toe or just under the feet. Um, they go into the hospital. Um, they end up with an amputation of the foot. And then that doesn't heal. It progresses to a, be a baloney amputation. 
and unfortunately, it may go on to an above knee amputation. And you know, very often patients come back and they complain bitterly. Oh, the doctors in Port of Spain or San Fernando or Mount Hope, all they want to do is cut off my leg. No, uh, you have not looked after yourself. You may have been a smoker. You have not looked after your diabetes and hypertension. You have allowed your cholesterol levels to be high and therefore you placed yourself at risk. You know, one of the things I often say to my patients is let's stop and, and to my church, of course, is let's stop playing the blame game. You know, we try to blame others for our lot in life. You know, you may have done things that you did not look after yourself as a younger person and you end up later in life with peripheral vascular disease. Now I'm gonna go on to the second um, cause of leg pain. And this is an interesting uh, diagram. Now, uh, what you will notice on the left leg um, where the hands are, there's redness and swelling. Redness and swelling. So I want you to note that. And, and the redness, if you notice, the main redness is just above the knee, um, around the, uh, the hamstring area. But the red, there's a kind of red thread of uh, going uh, lower down. And the diagram doesn't show you the whole picture, but the redness is actually extending down. So we'll come off that slide now. Um, and uh, so, so what is this? This is another cause of leg pain. And uh, so as we look at this, this could be one of two things. Interestingly, this could be a deep vein thrombosis or it could be cellulitis, which is infection of the skin and the superficial tissues of, of the leg and the thigh area. Notice that uh, the thigh area was very angry looking. Um, it was red inflamed. And very often, patients may come in with um, redness or slight swelling around the calf area. And the mistake that can be made is that we say that this is cellulitis, or just an infection. And we put the patient on sometimes oral antibiotics or maybe even intravenous antibiotics, and um, they're treated for an infection. The, the more serious condition is a deep vein thrombosis, a DVT. Now, this whole area of a DVT has become more and more popular, especially with um, people who are flying. You, you get lots of advice that um, if you're flying for more than five or six hours, you should get up, walk around, etc. Because basically, a deep vein thrombosis is a clot in the veins. Now. The first reason for leg pain I talked about was peripheral vascular disease. So we, we talked about that, peripheral vascular disease. That was about the arteries. Now, the second cause of leg pain I'm addressing is the veins. So I'm saying that um, the, the diagram I showed could be cellulitis, and that can be treated with uh, intravenous or um, oral antibiotics. Just, just a note on that, though. Um, if you're diabetic, uh, infections like this can spread very aggressively. And um, an infection of the leg should not be underestimated. Um, that infection can, can spread up the leg very, very aggressively. And therefore, if it's a cellulitis, cellulitis, you may need to have a bed rest, elevation of that leg, and either intravenous or oral antibiotics. If it's a DVT, and how do we diagnose? How do we know what the difference is? Well, both can be quite tender, but particularly a DVT of the calf is often very tender, very painful um, to touch. And it's sometimes swollen. So, so it, it, if you measure the calf um, diameter with a, with a simple tape measure, you'll notice that um, the calf with a, with, a, with a thrombosis will be larger than the other calf. Now, that doesn't always apply, so you, you can't depend on that. Ultimately, the, the way you diagnose a DVT is doing a, a, a venous Doppler. It's an ultrasound. Um, it's a Doppler venous ultrasound, and that will show whether there's a clot in the, in the veins, the superficial or the deep veins, 
um, of the, the calf area. Now, what, what is the seriousness of this? The serious aspect of this is if this is not treated, the vein can, de uh, sorry, the, the clot can detach itself and then move from the leg right up to the heart and to the lungs. And that's where you can get life-threatening, what we call a pulmonary embolus. Um, the pulmonary embolus is a clot in the lungs and that can uh, result in, in, in severe complications, needing urgent um, hospitalization, and if it's not treated um, aggressively, can lead to death. Um, so, so I want to repeat that. The clot in the leg itself um, is, is not really the major problem. It's if that clot is not diagnosed, it detaches itself, and then it goes up to the lungs and the heart and, and you have problems uh, like a pulmonary embolus where um, you then have uh, lung problems and um, severe breathing problems, etc. cetera. Um, now, there are lots of new drugs available now for treating uh, deep vein thrombosis. One of the things, of course, is we want to prevent the DVTs. Um, uh, DVTs are, of course, very common, unfortunately, in hospitalized patients. What do I mean by that? Of course, when you are post up, by, by, what do I mean by post up? You have had a major surgery, you are restricted to bed for a few days. Now, that's why, um, you know, the doctors are not trying to rush you out of the hospital after a surgery, but the days where you would, um, after a caesarean section or um, hysterectomy or bowel surgery, they will tell you to, that you have to be in bed for seven to 10 days. Those days are, are gone. What they try to do is get you up and out of bed as quickly as possible. Because the longer you stay supine, the longer you stay in bed, your leg is not moving. You're not, because um, remember, walking is the way of getting the muscles to contract and to relax, contract and relax. And by that action of contracting and relaxation, you prevent a deep vein thrombosis. That's why. Um, you know, you're told now if you're going on a long airplane flight, um, you should get up, walk around, um, especially if you have any pre-existing medical problems like diabetes, hypertension, or lots of varicose veins. Of, uh, a lot of people use the um, stockings now, the uh, compression stockings when they're traveling. And that's really for longer flights. You know, if you're going from here to Tobago, you know. You don't need um, a compression stockings. You, um, I'm talking about people who are going on long haul flights. I would say um, flights for over five hours. So, so uh, people who are at risk of deep vein thrombosis are those who are post operation. Um, that's why, as I said, after, for example, a caesarean section now, you're often out of the hospital after two days. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's no longer a week um, in hospital. After two days, you're encouraged to get up and start walking around. And, you know, sometimes patients believe that um, the nurses are being a bit cruel. They're trying to force you to go to the, um, uh, to the washrooms on your own. Um, no, it, they're trying to get you mobile so that they can prevent the risk of... Because we know that there have been so many people who have died of uh, deep vein thrombosis after operations. The operation has been very successful, but the DVT resulted in uh, premature death. Um, now, we, let me just, uh, we, we're gonna go to uh, the, the, the third one, um, but I'm probably gonna come back to this after our next break. So there's someone testing the sensation um, of the big two, and of course, this is in my particular area, diabetes. Um, we can come off the slide. Um, this is diabetic neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy. So we have talked about peripheral vascular disease. We have talked about uh, cellulitis. Now we're talking all, all, of, all of these presenting with leg pain, um, and so we're trying to make a proper diagnosis in our patients. And, and now um, we, we're talking about peripheral, sorry, diabetic neuropathy. 
We have to go to our second break. Um, we're going to come back in a few minutes. And when we come back, I will um, expand a bit on diabetic nerve pain. This is Denise Plummer, and you're watching ACTN. That's not turning back. Oh, no, 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 no. With Jesus on your side, that's the way to go. That's not turning back. Oh, no, 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 no. Because there is nothing greater when Jesus gives you favor. That's not turning back. Oh, no, 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 no. Welcome back to Your Health, Your Choice. Uh, just a reminder, we are. Um, this is a pre-recorded program. Um, unfortunately, we can't take your calls tonight, but um, we're going to be coming back live uh, in, in a few weeks' time, and we um, maybe you can pick up some of your calls on today's program on leg pain. And um, just to remind you again, um, I mentioned at the uh, second half, uh, the f uh, after the first segment, um, that we are having a diabetic seminar. Um, it's called a holistic approach to diabetes care. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it um, just before the end of the program. So we have talked about peripheral vascular disease. We have talked about cellulitis and DVT. And now we're talking about diabetic nerve pain. So um, how do patients present? So a lot of my diabetic patients come in with um, either a burning sensation, they say it's, um, I think the local word is gingeny. <laughs> they say, Dr. Khan, have you heard that word, gingeny? Um, it's, uh, you know, a, a pain that is, it's uh, sometimes uh, intractable kind of pain that um, prevents you from sleeping at night. And um, it's, it's, it, it, it prevents you from being able to function properly. I'm gonna show that slide again. Um, can we just bring that slide back one more time um, on diabetic nerve pain? Um, so what we are seeing here is someone is testing for um, sensation. Uh, this is a, a very common um, piece of equipment that we use. Um, it's uh, just basically um, a, a, a blunt instrument, and we are, we are trying to test for sensation of on, on the big toe, and then we test for just under that, the metatarsal area, and then under the heel area. Okay, so we can uh, uh, come off that slide now. We, uh, yeah, we are just, I just wanted to show you that slide again um, to uh, remind you that uh, diabetic nerve pain can be, uh, it, it, it can be uh, diagnosed with um, a simple instrument like that, 
or diabetic nerve pain can also be um, diagnosed by what we call nerve conduction studies. Um, now, that's a more complicated test. Um, I, I would, you know, if a patient comes in to me, I, I would not be able to do that test myself. I would have to send you to a neurologist, and the neurologist would um, then do some detailed um, electrical conduction studies on the nerves, and they could come up with a definitive diagnosis of um, peripheral neuropathy um, or diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Now, remember, peripheral neuropathy can be due to diabetes, but it can be due to um, vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, it can also be due to hypothyroidism. Um, it can also um, be due to alcoholism, excess alcohol intake. So not all nerve pain is due to diabetes, but the typical diabetic neuropathy is often both feet, both feet are affected, and um, it, it, it's, it's called a, a sort of glove and stocking, so a stocking distribution. Um, it starts with the feet and it can start creeping up the leg, um, and then you can even have symptoms in your hands. Um, often patients um, complain that they have tingling in their hands. Now, uh, one thing to be careful about where that is concerned is that there's something called carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome is, is something that can mimic neuropathy very closely. So diabetic peripheral neuropathy um, can give you that typical burning pain. Um, there's also another type of pain that diabetics can uh, present with. It's called diabetic amyotrophy. Now that's a big word, diabetic amyotrophy, A-M-Y. O T R O P H Y amyotrophy. This is where you may have a severe pain just in one nerve area, like like the inside of the thighs, for example. Um, it's so you 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 have severe pain in that area, and um, you can mistake that for a, a pinched nerve, for example. But that could be diabetic amyotrophy. So we have diabetic peripheral neuropathy, but you have diabetic um, amyotrophy. Again, how do you treat um, diabetic nerve pain? Well, you're trying to get the patient's blood sugars under better control. Unfortunately, again, if you have had diabetes for a number of years and your diabetes was not well controlled, um, the, when we get your diabetes under good control, although your A1C might be 6.5, you still have the severe pain because the nerve end has already been affected. Um, there's very little we can do to um, get that nerve um, regenerated. Um, we, we use some natural supplements like alpha lipoic acid, um, neurobean fort, but really controlling the symptoms. And the, t the, the medications we use are fairly strong medications like Lyrica, Cymbalta, gabapentin and um, I know a lot of my patients are very hesitant to use these drugs but unfortunately um, to give you a good quality of life we have no option so we're gonna go to our next slide and uh, uh, this uh, is there are two slides I would like to show because th these two slides are to do with um, the back actually leg pain coming from the spine. Because remember, the, the way you sense pain is that the nerves that innervate the legs actually come from the lumbar spine, the lower spine. So what do you notice here on the right-hand side? On the left-hand side, you see a normal spine. Um, and then on the left, on, on the right side of the slide, you see that there's actually um, almost a, a stenosis or blockage of the spine. And this is a fairly severe condition uh, that that's called spinal stenosis. And then the second and more common problem is what we call a pinched nerve. So you have the nerves coming out and as a result of very, oft, uh, very often just wear and tear, um, you have the nerve being compressed and you have um, L4, L5 sometimes being affected and that nerve pain results in shooting pains down the legs. So we're going to just come off that slide now. So I've shown you two diagrams there. 
um, that can um, result in uh, pain in the legs. Now, with spinal stenosis, um, normally the pain might be in both legs, and sometimes you have the pain when you're walking around, and if you bend over, it kind of opens up the spine and the pain might actually improve with spinal stenosis. Now, that's, that's a, a less common presentation of leg pain. Sciatica, of course, is a very, very common problem. And, and we see lots of patients coming in with sciatica. And um, it's due, as I said, to the, as the nerve exits from the spine, you have um, the pinching of the nerve due to sometimes what we call osteophytes, which is basically due to wear and tear, arthritic changes in the spine. You have um, the nerve being pinched and you get a shooting pain down the leg. And it's usually one leg. Um, so it might be right or left. Usually it's, you know, if somebody's coming with bilateral leg pain, then I wouldn't think of sciatica. Sciatica is often um, just one leg that is involved and the pain is a shooting pain down the leg. Now, this is a very difficult problem to treat sometimes. And often um, it might be due to, pro so it could be due to arthritis, um, the osteophytes, but it could also be due to um, uh, what we call a prolapsed disc. Um, because between you have the thoracic, well, that's, if you start from the neck, you have the cervical vertebrae. Um, C1 to C6, C7, then you have the thoracic vertebrae, and then you have the lumbar vertebrae, which is uh, L1 to L5, and then you have the sacrum. And if you have a pro and between each vertebrae, you have um, the vertebral pads, and if you have a prolapsed disc, um, you then get compression of the nerves. And that's where sometimes um, surgery is needed. Now, uh, back surgery is uh, not to be taken lightly. It's a, a major surgery. Um, how is it diagnosed? Um, well, an MRI scan of the back is, is the um, investigation of choice. And of, of course, um, sometimes on the uh, government service, um, MRI scans are not always easily available. And in the private sector, you're talking about maybe five to $6,000 for an MRI scan. Um, but, but that is the definitive way. And if someone is coming in with persistent lower back pain, um, now, if you're 20, 25, um, I may not, you know, rush you in to doing an MRI scan um, uh, because sometimes it may just be a muscular spasm. So, so remember, um, not all leg pain is due to a prolapsed disc because um, sometimes just spasm of the muscles around the vertebral column can, can, can lead to leg pain sometimes. But if we are looking just at that kind of shooting pain down the leg, we are talking about sciatica. So the approach to treating sciatica, again, um, you may need to, to look at physiotherapy. Physiotherapy is very important. Um, you want to think about um, seeing either an orthopedic surgeon uh, or a neurosurgeon. And then sometimes drug therapy, again, things like Lyrica, Gabapentin, etc., might be um, very helpful. So spinal stenosis, sciatica, two very common problems. And uh, I tell you, sciatica, um, especially people who are very active in their 40s and 50s um, and are doing manual types of jobs, um, it can end up having severe economic effects. Um, on their livelihood, et cetera, because they're not able to do the job uh, that they're employed to do. And very often people have to retire early because of consistent lower back pain. So let's go on to our next problem. Um, I'm gonna bring up this slide again. Um, and what, what is this showing? Um, again, we are looking at um, the uh, hip area. So if, if you look carefully, you're looking at uh, the hip joint, both on the right and the left side. So, so where the circles are, you're looking at the, um, the, the right and the left hip, and you can see that there's, uh, that should be a nice ball and socket joint. 
and you can see that there's blurring of the joint margins and that is osteoarthritis. So we'll just come off um, of, of that slide. Um, osteoarthritis of the hips, knees, very, very common, and it can result in generalized leg pain, um, not just in the hip area, because you can have what is called referred pain. So you can have osteoarthritis of the hip, but you end up having pain in the thighs or the knees or the lower leg, um, and uh, the pain is actually originating from the hip area. So it's, it's, it's an easy diagnosis to make with simple x-rays. Um, unfortunately, um, this is wear and tear. It, it, it comes on as we get older, um, and very often um, you have people needing hip replacements, knee replacements, etc. Time is going very quickly. We only have about six or seven more minutes, so I want to show you um, another slide. Um, I'll show you two slides here. Um, uh, one is uh, and now two athletes jumping over. Um, basically, this is um, uh, strained muscles, and the next one is a sprained ankle. So um, uh, the, the first one was um, uh, athlete uh, jumping over the hurdles, and this is um, the ankle there showing a sprained ankle. So uh, let's just close off our program. Uh, we only have about six more minutes talking about those two. Um, a sprained um, ankle, of course, um, it could be you're just walking down the road, and especially um, the women who love those high heel shoes, um, you have to be very careful. Um, as you're walking, you can twist your ankle very, very easily. And um, not just athletes, but, but simply exercising if you don't warm up. You know, we are starting some fitness classes at our church this evening. And one of the things I'm sure the fitness instructor will be telling um, the people who come out uh, for, for those classes is that you have to warm up properly. Because if you don't, you can end up with a muscle strain. And of course, we know uh, muscle strains are, um, or ligament strains can be very, very painful. Um, and um, can lead to, if you are a professional athlete, um, uh, you may lead to, need to take weeks and weeks of training. Um, so the treatments for these are, of course, um, seeing uh, maybe a sports doctor, orthopedic surgeon, getting a proper diagnosis. Now, let me just say a sprained ankle, people often underestimate. So, you know, if you have a broken bone, if you have a actually chipped bone or a fracture of a bone in the ankle, you're, you're put into um, a cast and um, it's rested. Very often a sprained uh, ligament uh, or a sprained ankle is, is, is ignored, not treated properly, and then for weeks and months and even years later, you end up with what some people might call a weak ankle. So constantly um, recurring injuries where you, you just twist the ankle slightly, it gets swollen again, you have to keep the, 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 the feet off, um, the weight off, um, and uh, you end up with problems. So don't underestimate a sprained ankle. I haven't had time to talk about um, the Achilles tendon. You know, a ruptured Achilles tendon is, is, is a major, major injury. Um, um, I had a family member who was lifting weights and suddenly heard a pop and he ended up with a ruptured um, Achilles tendon and had to be in a cast and be treated for um, a number of uh, months. Um, so um, that's an obvious injury, um, but, but night cramps, night cramps is the, is the other big area that I don't have time to talk about and maybe I should have addressed this earlier, but a lot of people get up during the night with night cramps. And unfortunately, um, it can be extremely painful. I have to tell you that I have had night cramps over the years. And you get up in the middle of the night and it is horrendous. You can hardly walk. Um, you're sometimes cramped up in pain. Um, you try to walk it off. Um, you try to rub the area. Um, it, and, and we still don't quite know what the reason is for leg cramps. Some people think it's dehydration. Um, some people now are talking about um, magnesium deficiency, um, some other um, salt deficiency, etc. Um, but we still don't know. We still don't quite know um, the reason for leg cramps. So if you're having recurrent leg cramps, 
Um, make sure you're well hydrated before going to bed. Um, drink lots of water. Um, make sure that um, if you, you know, measure your magnesium levels um, and, and, and see if there are any uh, mineral deficiencies, etc. But even your, just positioning yourself, how you position yourself in the bed might um, result in leg cramps. I hope this program has been helpful. Again, I apologize that we have not been able to take um, live calls uh, today. It's a pre-recorded program, um, but uh, in the next few weeks, we're gonna come back live. I wanna apologize for my dear wife, Linda, not being with us because we had to pre-record this program. Um, the time was not convenient for us to do it together, but she'll be back on um, uh, on the next, um, uh, hopefully next time we do a program, it'll be live on a Wednesday night. Remember, this program is replayed Thursdays at 1 p.m. and Sunday evenings at 7 p.m. So just quickly now, I just want to remind you about our seminar, um, a holistic approach to diabetes care. It's going to be held on Saturday, the 11th of November from 4 to 6 p.m. We're going to have a podiatrist, um, a diabetes educator, an optometrist and myself, four speakers. It's going to be an excellent program. I want to encourage you to ring in on 482-4269 um, or go to our website, www.anaposiscommunity.com um, and uh, ring in, register, and make sure you come and um, get as much diabetes education as possible. As I end, um, I put on my pastoral hat. I only have about one minute left. Um, we have been preaching a series of sermons at uh, the Trinidad and Tobago Anaposis Chapel on grace, God's grace. A few weeks ago, um, we talked about uh, God's sustaining grace. Um, and what is grace? Grace is simply uh, God's love for us, even though we don't deserve it. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, this Sunday, I'll be preaching on God's healing grace, his healing grace. And what I want to say to you, I remember reading a book a few weeks ago, uh, sorry, a few years ago, called The Scandal of God's Grace. God's grace is extended for those who deserve it the least. And very often our churches are filled with religious people. And very often we feel, and you know, those of us like myself who have grown up in church life, we often feel that we might be better than the person who's coming into our church who's who's been homeless, who's been on drugs, etc. I want to tell you, in the kingdom of God, there is a level playing field. If you come to the foot of the cross, no matter what your past has been, God will extend his grace to you. Thank you for joining us tonight on Your Health, Your Choice. Uh, we're going to come back with a, hopefully a live program in a few weeks' time. I hope the information on leg pain has been useful. And uh, make sure and tune into the repeat programs if you have missed out any of the information tonight. Thank you for joining us. Good evening and good night. The preceding program is in no way intended to replace your doctor's advice or treatment program, nor should it be used as a tool for the purpose of self-diagnosis.